David Lynch is widely regarded to be America's premier avant-garde filmmaker. You need look no further than the following films, Lost Highway, Blue Velvet, Eraser Head, and The Elephant Man. Why didn't you tell me you could read? Would you afraid? David Lynch's unique place in cinema continues with his latest film, The Straight Story. It has already been recognized by the National Board of Review as one of the year's 10 best films. I am pleased to have David back at this table. Welcome back. Thank you, Charlie. It's good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just talk about The Straight Story first and, sure. and, and how it fits in sort of the evolution of a filmmaker. Uh, when did you tell me the story? The story of how it happened, yeah, how yeah, I came how, to do how it. How you came to do the film. Okay. Um, in 1994, Alvin made this journey. This is Alvin Strait. Alvin Strait. And uh, he traveled on his riding lawnmower to visit his brother. Who was, who was very ill. Who was very ill. And um, the newspapers covered this story. Toward the end, people got, you know, uh, aware of it and started covering it. And Mary Sweeney uh, read about it in the New York Times. Uh, she held uh, this, you know, desire for four years to want to, you know, write the story and, and get it made. And I'm hearing about it. Um, I live with Mary. I and, know, I was going to say, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I live with her, and, and every morning, you know, every night, I'm hearing about uh, the straight story. Straight story, straight story. But she didn't get the rights for it uh, until 1998. Yeah. So um, when she got the rights, she and her childhood friend, John Roach, sat down and wrote the script. They wrote it pretty fast. They took the whole journey. They went and interviewed many people, talked to the straight family, um, and wrote a script. Um, that I think of all the scripts I've read, I've really only liked four scripts, and this is one of the four. I, I loved this script. I didn't think that I would love it. And um, so once I read the script, I was, I was there. All right, now th here's what's interesting about this. What are the other three scripts that you've loved? Okay, I loved a script called Love in Vain yeah. about Robert Johnson. Right. Great script. I loved two scripts by a guy named Gregory Brooker spring of 61 and the fall and rise of Glenn mm. and um, those th those three I loved yeah and plus and so then yeah. now Mary wants you to direct it she says take a look at this and see if you're interested in right. directing it right and you but everybody notes first of all this is not like anything you've ever done before right I um, it was it was curious. I, I I'm reading the script and I'm I'm feeling things. And I've always said that s s the film is uh, such a beautiful language. It can it can do abstractions. It, it can do abstractions. And it abstractions are the the combination of all these different elements that you have in a film. Um, it can do an abstraction of emotion. And I felt this emotion coming from the script. And that's what I really, that's what lit my fire. That, the, that the emotion thing. of what? The emotion coming from a scene, from a word, from a look. Um, when you read something, we all have the experience, we picture it in our minds. And the, those pictures, those initial things, are what guide us from then on. And so as this thing, you know, I was picturing it, I'm, I, at the same time, I'm feeling things, and I'm thinking film can do this, and it could be beautiful. You spent 21 days filming. 
No, no, 30, 31. Okay, 31 days. Yeah. Right, 10 more. 10 and, more. And that makes Iowa, a big difference. <laughs> you filmed it sequentially, too. We had to film in sequence, yes. Yeah. Richard Farnsworth. Was he the unanimous choice? Oh, yeah. Because he's brilliant in this. Yeah. Um, we are so lucky uh, to have had Richard in this film. And everybody who's seen the film uh, agrees that, that um, Richard is spectacular. I loved working with him. I think he's one of the all-time great actors. He doesn't consider himself an actor, uh, which is kind of sad, but, but okay. Um, he came about acting through, uh, he was in the rodeo, uh, then he was a stuntman, and then he came into acting. And he never really, uh, because maybe he didn't study or he didn't do this or didn't do that, but the guy can make it real from way deep inside of him and it's a beautiful thing to watch do you consider yourself in your heart a painter or a director i'm 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 both you know um that's that's what i am both <laughs> <laughs> i'm also a, a great guitar player well, are you really yeah <laughs> <laughs> how about cook no no i don't like cooking at all no. <laughs> don't like it at all no what else do you do well you paint you direct you play the guitar? Um, no, I'm, I'm very interested in music. I'm not a guitar player. I play the guitar, <laughs> but um, uh, I am very interested in sound yeah. and, and music. I love working with Angelo Badalamenti. He's done everything you've done since yeah, the 80s. Yeah, since Blue Velvet, right. Yeah. And um, now I have my own studio, and um, the, the primary purpose of it was to be able to experiment. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a, a great thing to be able to do. All right, let's take a look. Why is this man's journey, Alvin Strait, played by Richard Farnsworth, across Iowa to see his very sick brother on a tractor? <laughs> Interesting. Um, it has to do with um, the reason he, he makes the trip. And it has to do with the difficulty of the trip. And it has to do with his age and... Uh, um, the things in his heart. That's what I'm saying. It yeah. has to do with what he feels and what he sees. Right. And how he feels about what he sees. It's a, it's a beautiful reason to make the trip, and the trip has to be done in a certain way. And um, that's, that's, you know, what it's all about. And that, that comes through, you know, uh, for me, uh, and, um, you know, I, I think for others. All right. Roll tape. Here it is, a scene with Alvin Strait, and when he's talking to his daughter, Rose, who's played by kind of a, an eccentric daughter, played by Sissy Spacey, about going to visit his brother Lyle. Here it is. Rosie, I, I've got to go see Lyle. And I, I've got to make this trip on my own. I know you understand. If you don't like that, then, you know, you're not living on this planet. Well, um, that's, that's a beautiful scene. And uh, Sissy did an... Uh, a spectacular job, as well as Richard, why as well want, as everybody. I why think. did you want Sissy? I've always wanted to work with her. She's married to Jack Fisk, who's right. one of my, he's my oldest and best friend. So. He's a, is he a screenwriter, a director? What is he's, he? He's, he started out as a, a production designer, yeah. and he worked with Terry Malick and, you know, a, a bunch of people. And then he went into directing, and now he came back to production design. And so this is the first time we worked work together, and uh, first time I worked with Sissy, even though I've, I've wanted to work with her, but you've got to get the right part lined up with the right person and it happened this time now did, did is, is mary happy with what you did with her script i hope so yeah <laughs> or else you know come <laughs> home tonight yeah, yeah she's happy <laughs> she's, she's also the editor so exactly yeah. so um and that's in fact what her profession is right is right she's more yeah editor. but she's producer now and editor and um now a writer so yeah. she's taking you know taking over uh now having done this was it difficult for you? Was because it's not the kind of thing you had been used to doing. There was all. I mean, Blue Velvet. This is a long way from Blue Velvet. It's not difficult. Um, every film is difficult in a way, but it's so much fun, and uh, the story dictates everything. And so, once you fall in love, and those pictures form, and you stay true to those early feelings, true to the story. You go. It's the same as, as every film. I, I know it's different than most of my other work, but the, the way it goes is the same. And, and, and it wasn't any more difficult to do because you're dealing with capturing the emotion of 
Was it easier? No, it wasn't easier. Um, in some ways, it was more difficult. This thing about emotion, you know, it's, it's, it's an intuitive thing. Uh, the, the, the film talks to you, and uh, the story talks to you, and uh, so it's a little bit action and reaction. You know, you, you're, you're experimenting as you go to get the thing to feel correct. And, and how come it, it has to feel correct to me? And um, so you work and work until, until it does feel correct. And on this, there were fewer elements going along in the sequences. And so each one became more important. And I start getting, you know, real fascinated about the way um, a sound would um, present itself, how it would uh, come up out of nothing and, and go and how it, could, how it would die away. Those things became real critical. Uh, the way the way things appeared and, and disappeared. Some will argue that restraint can heighten the emotional effect. It's it's um, too little is not so good. Too much is not so good. Mm. It's that magic uh, point when when it all the lights go off like a pinball machine and you know you're you're there, but you don't know exactly how you got there. All right, roll tape. This is one final scene because I think Richard Farnsworth is so great in this in which he talks about the importance of family. When my kids were real little, I used to play a game with them. I'd give each one of them a stick and one for each one of them. And I'd say, you break that. Um, put this in the context of things you have done. How do you feel about it? Is it just part of the evolution of one man's? I feel very good about it. Um, it's uh, a film that I think um, it's out there right now, and it's it's holding its own, and apparently it, ha it has very good word of mouth. And I, I'm just hoping that it can hold out there um, and that people will go experience it on the big screen. Mm -hmm. I think in time it will have a very good um, reputation, this particular uh, film. Any longing within you to make peace with something? Yeah, maybe myself. Yourself? Yeah. <laughs> you're at war with yourself, or are you I trying to understand is. yourself, or are you on a trying journey to, understand to, to, yeah. to, to understand contradictory impulses? Or? Exactly, yeah, to, to figure it out. Yeah. It's a mystery. Is this simply a case of a gifted filmmaker seeing a script he loved? Or can you make more of the fact that you're doing this film in terms of the cycles and the evolution of the life, of a creative artist's life? I um, have said that I, I, I think first you read a script and, or a book or you get ideas and you begin to fall in love. And at the same time, you feel a thing in the air. And the thing in the air is always changing. And something about the thing in the air um, verifies your love or you kind of goes against it. And in this case, it went, you know, with it, the thing in the air. And um, so it felt correct to go forward. What's the thing in the air? I don't know what it is. It's, uh, it might be um, in Germany, they say it's a zeitgeist. Yeah, they right. told me that name for it. Um, you know and I don't know if that is this, yeah. this thing that is always changing yeah. and it's a product it? I think of every one of us and uh, since we're always you know moving about and changing and going forward um, this thing is always changing and it and it tells you something okay you know the question I'm really asking does this fact that David Lynch at this point in his life is making this film mm -hmm. beyond the fact that it was a script he liked say something I mean here David Mamet's making the Winslow boy mm hmm I don't know when Wenders is making Buena Vista mm -hmm. Club yeah, that's a great, uh, great thing. It's a great documentary. Yeah, yeah it's right. a great one, yeah. Um, I mean, you know what I mean? Is yeah, it, I know it, exactly what you mean. I don't think it says uh, so much about me. I, said, I think, it's, I think um, people do feel this thing in the air, and it might alter our thinking a hair. Um, you, you, you don't know what you're going to fall in. The most important thing is what you fall in love with. And the reason you fall in love is an abstraction. Nobody knows why they fall in love with this woman and not this one. Yeah, or why they fall out of love. Or why they fall out. Well, they know that a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> uh, but so, and you can't figure it out. In other words, you can't, you can't sit here and say to me, I can tell you what was in the air. It was this, this, and mm -hmm. this. No, 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 you it can't. Just, it's a, it's it's a beautiful a abstraction. Beautiful yeah. abstraction of mm -hmm. some kind of a psychic thing. Mm -hmm. What kind of paintings are you painting then? I'm painting <laughs> with glue. 
Um, <laughs> I like texture, and oil paint is very expensive. So I found this tile cement that's, um, that's not so toxic, but you can get a five-gallon tub of it for pretty cheap. It's really sticky. But if I paint outside, and a little bit later, the sun starts cooking it, and uh, it becomes less and less sticky. And then if I mix paint in with it, sometimes I set it on fire. They're glue paintings. Yeah. And uh, they're organic. And I try to get nature to work with me on, on the uh, things. Yeah, do do you, you paint out on top of your house is where you're... Is that yeah. where your studio is? Yes, it is. Yeah. You just go up there in the sunlight and paint. Exactly right. Now, why do you paint outside? Well, because there's a lot of um, toxic things um, involved with the, with well, the work. I see. So you've got to be yeah. outside so and, that and nobody gets sick. I like the way sick. the sunlight uh, it works on it. It cooks it. In California, it gets sometimes very hot. But what are you painting with this glue? Well, I'm painting a series of uh, this character, uh, Bob, um, and, <laughs> and his you know, particular um, concerns, I guess. Yeah. Speaking of Bob, just tell me the story about when you were going to Bob's Big Boy mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. You've got a fixation. Oh, yes, I do. Because <laughs> I love you. Milk. Love chocolate? Uh, you like chocolate milkshakes? No, no, no. I like vanilla milkshake. Vanilla milkshake. Yeah, you like chocolate. Uh, I like chocolate. Yeah. yeah. But but did, what else would you eat with this? Milkshake? Just a coffee. Oh, but coffee. you had all this sugar in the coffee. Yeah, yeah, I had sugar. Now, what was going on there? Was well, it, it was a, giving you a high that made you think giving, clearly? Yeah, but I, I didn't. Um, I, I'm. It's, it is like a, a drug, I suppose. The sugar can be. Uh, yeah, because it revs you up. And, um, but I, I went, as you know, at 2.30 <laughs> in the afternoon yes. because the, the, they pour a, um, a liquid into these machines, right. and it has to have time to get cold to become thick. Right. During lunch, there's a turnover, and so they're always kind of thin. But after the lunch settles down, before the thing gets too old in the machine, it has time to congeal and get nice and thick. And you got a chance for getting a great uh, shake. <laughs> but you gave it up. Yeah, I gave it up. And you gave up all the sugar or saccharin or whatever it is you use in the coffee, too. Sugar. But I gave it up. One time I went through the garbage uh, behind Bob's. And <laughs> I found the, the carton of the, the mixture. <laughs> and I couldn't uh, make sense of any of the, the ingredients. And I figured it was enough time of having the, had those, and I should stop. What's in the air for you now in terms of the, the movies? So what are you eating at first? Tell me what you're eating. I'm eating, um, for lunch, tomatoes, tuna fish, feta cheese, and uh, olive oil. <laughs> now, here's what's interesting about you. <laughs> you eat that every day. Every day. Every yeah. day. Mm -hmm. You eat the same thing. Yeah, it's, well, I, I, it's, it's very good. You know? <laughs> well, I'm sure it is. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't eat it every day. Right, we? right, exactly. And what do we eat for dinner? Chicken, little pieces of chicken and broccoli, and a little soy sauce. <laughs> every day. Yeah, every day, except when I travel, then I, I go off that. <laughs> is this, can we, can we say you're a creature of habit? Yes. Um, habit in a daily routine. Yeah. And, um, and then when there's some sort of order there, then you're free to mentally go off uh, any any place. You've got a, a safe sort of foundation and, and a place to spring off from. Yeah, and, and you view that in terms of the creative process as very important. It was very important for me. For you, yeah. right. You don't like a cluttered room when you're thinking. No, I, the, the purer the environment, the more you know fantastic the interior uh, world can be, it seems to me. Yeah. Can, you, can you help me understand where you may be going now? now that you've done this film? What's in the air? I, I, in the air, I, I think things are, like, as they say, they're always changing. Yeah. Um, I think right now the air is filled with uh, Y2K. Um, yeah. And maybe in January it'll settle down and we'll see what, what's really there. But uh, we got to get through Y2K first. we got to get this thing. It's a very busy kind of uh, thing in the air now. Yeah. But um, I don't know what I'll fall in love with. You know, that's, that's for sure. I don't have the next thing. Yeah, and, and falling in love is really what it's about. It's all about that, yeah. You'd rather tell a long story than make a movie. No, no, I love both the things okay, you uh, do very both. much. Um, it's just a, a continuing story uh, allows you so many different surprises, and you're not, you're not having to wrap things up. And you can have one thing lead to this thing, lead to this thing, and then um, come back to relate to something that was introduced way back here. And, and those things are thrilling uh, for us. Is Dune the worst mistake you Was that? That was a, that, that was wasn't a, a mistake. I learned a lot. And I, 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 
it was a it was a little bit maybe more than a little I sold out I didn't have final cut and I knew the way people were um, and I adjusted and you can't you really can't do that two things you got to know yeah final cut <laughs> I know that I know I learned that Charlie. and owning your own thing yeah I haven't learned that but, that but we'll yet. get there too yeah. <laughs> uh, what of the all the things you have made I realize it's a silly question but give me what what's what are you most proud of? I, I, um, I, I they're, you know, they, like they say, they're all like children. children. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, you, I, I like every film, uh, and, uh, but there always is the feeling, since nothing's ever perfect, something makes you want to go again. And there's something about this beautiful language, you just think it can, it can do something that would be so thrilling to the soul. And so you're looking for a story that allows for modern cinema, beautiful feelings, and all in one story. And, and so you just keep, it keeps pulling you. I, Woody Allen once said, if you really want to understand the 60s, you've got to see what was going on in the 50s that led to the 60s. For sure. Elvis being one. Exactly. And the Beatles, always you look before. Like influenced a lot of times by that. People make a film that's set in the 50s. Right. Now. You know, right, or, right. You know, so they go and they find 50s furniture and put it in the house and make the film. When in reality, in, if you went, went in somebody's house in the 50s, you'd see furniture from the 30s, 20s, right, exactly. you know, 40s. Nobody hardly any had, but people had yeah. the 50s stuff. Do you know which generation, what, at what period you'd like to live in if you didn't in live the in 50s. this one? In the yeah, 50s. Yeah, 56, yeah. Somewhere 56. around. Yeah, I'd like to live to 56, yeah. <laughs> Why 56? I don't know. The birth of rock and roll was very yeah. powerful. And there was a feeling in the air then that I, I liked. I, I was a child, so uh, that, that makes it. I, I wasn't seeing the whole picture. But in my little world, I felt a, a real, you know, uh, positive thing happening. Yeah. Even in Missoula? No, I was in Boise, Idaho. Oh, in Boise, yeah, by then. Yeah, you, by then, yeah. Um, there are those also who look at Blue Velvet and, was it Wild at Heart? I've forgotten the title. Was it Wild? Wild at Heart. Wild at Heart. Mm -hmm. And they say, there is a man uh, with some weird ideas mm -hmm. about sex. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, uh, everybody knows that any avenue has their extremes, you know, one where, and there's most in, in the middle, you know, a balance. Uh, Wild at Heart was all about an extreme, a, a crazy world, uh, crazy activities, you know, things just coming apart. That was really in the air. When I finished reading uh, Barry Gifford's book, it married itself with the, the, this insanity sort of it was in the air things were kind of flying apart and i i love the idea of a love story in the middle of an insane world so yeah. everything was kind of out right. and um but sailor and lula were very much equal one to another the man and the woman he respected her she respected him i like that in the middle of this crazy modern you know thing but they were with each other they knew what they wanted and and they were together dennis Hopper influenced Blue Velvet by his sheer intensity and performance for you. Mm -hmm. Did he not? Oh, sure. Yeah, somebody else. I, I mean, he was born to play. Uh, he admitted it. He said, I am Frank. <laughs> That's what yeah, he said. Yeah, you yeah, you yeah. once told me the story. Yeah. Didn't he call you up and, he say, called me up. and said, I'm Frank? That was good news and bad news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the bad news? The bad news was I had to work with this guy. You know, I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know. Oh, you were saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How often have you fell in love with the, your actress? actresses in your film. Oh, man, you're getting personal. Um, I, I fall in love with them uh, all because um, they're... Because work and love and all that is part of who you are. Yeah, they're, well, I've worked with some great, you know, uh, people and uh, work brings you, you know, close and um, it's a special, special thing. And um, they, there's actors and actresses uh, that's a very tough life, and and when they're when they're going, it's it's very delicate, and things have to be, be nice, you know, for them. Things have to be nice for them. Yeah, they have to feel safe, mm -hmm. and so they can leave themselves and take on another thing and make it real. Yeah. And um, uh, the ones I've I've worked with, I've been uh, they've been very great. <laughs> so are you. in doing that. So are you. Straight Story is a wonderful, wonderful film, deserving of all the accolades that it's receiving. And uh, Mary Sweeney deserves enormous 
credit she does. for she does, yeah. writing the screenplay and playing the role that she played in seeing that this film made it to the screen. The screen. Yeah, absolutely. Richard Farnsworth and Sissy Spacek and so many people. I mean, it just shows me the power of storytelling, the power of sort of basic sense of one man driven by a reason in his own heart mm -hmm. to go. As he said in that first scene, I've got to go. Forget anything else. I've got to go. Exactly, Charlie. Sure. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much, Pleasure. Sure. It was good to see you again. Thank you. Really good. Me too. Me okay. too. David Lynch, the director. The film is called The Straight Story. We'll be right back. Stay with us.